Welcome back to the Behind Their Business podcast, or if this is your first time listening, welcome to the show. Today, our guest is going to talk about how she made her business work for her as a single mother. And I know we have some single moms in the audience. So this episode is going to be really helpful to get some advice and guidance from somebody who's gone down that path before you. And she actually started her business from the kitchen table when her children were very small and she was a single mom and has since then built it into a multi-million dollar business, which is so incredible, so inspirational. So please welcome to the show, Jan Cavell. Jan, I am so glad that you are here. Thank you so, so much for inviting me on the show. It's been great. It's been a long time since we last uh, first spoke, I think, but or first were in contact, but I've been looking forward to it very much. Yes, yes, me too. So let's dive into your journey. So take me from where you were all of those years ago when you were sitting at that kitchen table as a single mom to where you are now. Sure. Well, like many of your listeners, you know, I found myself a single mom through a messy divorce. Well, the divorce took a lot longer, but split with my ex-husband. Um, so there I was, um, very acrimonious divorce um, going on in the background, very broke. Uh, I mean, really broke. I was on income support, um, you know, so I was really penniless for the two of them. And they were only sort of four and eight, I guess, at the time, something like that. Um, four and seven, maybe even. So very small kids, worried whether I could keep a roof over my head, their head, um, wondering where whether I could keep meals coming in. And, uh, and you know, so I was looking at my options and they were also, because it was a bit messy, they were also quite distressed, um, you know, at the time it was um, early on in the split. And I didn't want to leave them, you know, and again, I'm sure this is something, you know, a lot of your listeners will identify with. You don't, you know, you're, you're reluctant. It's the moment your kids need you the most and you're faced with this thing of having to go out to work, you know. It's a tough choice. And so I thought the only option was to start my own business. Um, again, I had experience in being self-employed and starting very, very micro businesses, um, you know, as, as more of a hobby and a way of getting out of having a proper job, not as a serious proposition of I'm going to have to earn money, you know, but it, it, at least it was something. And also when I've been in work and had to take proper jobs, I tended to do sales jobs. So it was a sort of logical thing that I thought maybe if I could buy stuff in, that stuff being pretty unspecified at first, um, and sell it on, I could do that and look after the kids at the same time. And it was, you know, as you rightly say, it was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> So it was pre-internet days, you know, and so I had to, what I had was a fax phone and a card index box, and that was my office setup, you know. So um, what I'd do on a Friday, um, because I couldn't research clients on the internet, we didn't have that option, is I'd buy trade directories for sort of local, what we call over here, yellow pages, uh, and I'd get one area at a time. I can't remember what they charged. For them. I think it was five or six quid a book. And so I could only afford one on my check, you know. And, uh, but it would give me a list of several hundred companies, some of which, you know, were relevant and might buy from me and a lot of which weren't. But therefore I could hit the phone. And my goodness, did I hit the phone. You know, there has never been such a determined telephone sales <laughs> campaign going on, but it was it was still very, very tough, very tough. And that juggle, which I'm sure you all know of, you know, the kids need you, the business needs you, how are you going to feed them? Oh, they need you. It's, it's a real tough, tough call. Oh, yes. I, I have been doing that juggle for, well, my son's two and a half, so about two and a half years now. And that mom guilt, it really does creep in. It doesn't it, it just, doesn't it just. Yeah, it can be debilitating some days when you hear your child crying on the other side of the door, yeah. just wanting to spend time with you, but you know that yeah. you need to be working, right? It's so tricky. I mean, I remember, 
I was thinking about this. Uh, it's not a story I think I've told before, but I was thinking about this just before getting on the phone to you or the Zoom call, should I say. You know, and I remember I was due to pick up my son from preschool and I was sort of knee deep in work. And I kept on thinking, you know, I'm getting a lockdown, getting a lockdown. And of course, it wasn't that I was getting a lot done. Again, pre-computer, the battery in my clock had stopped. And so I was late, big time late. I mean, it's because of an hour and hour late, which, you know, and there he was and the fuming headmistress on the, you know, um, on the doorstep waiting for me. He was in floods of tears and, you know, Oh, the guilt, as you say, you know, you, do you go or want you try and earn a living or do you stop? You are a dreadful person, you know, um, which, which, of course, is completely untrue, but it, it really kills you. Right. If, it almost feels like there's no winning, right? Like you if you want to go out, build this business, build this dream for your family, you're going to be a quote unquote bad person because you're not spending enough time with them. If you go get a traditional job and you have to put your kids in daycare, you're still a bad person because you're not spending enough time with them. Absolutely. And, then if you, and then if you stay home, you're going crazy a lot of the time and you don't even want to spend time with them. It's I, such know, a, I know, I know. It's, it's so tough. And, you know, for whatever reason, you end up a single mom and, you know, the, the chances are you didn't plan it. I mean, there are one or two people who do, but, you know, you might be widowed or, or divorced and you don't set out to do that. Or, you know, you might have got pregnant by accident in theory accident whatever the reason you know it's rarely pre-planned and you're faced with this situation as you say you know you end up um feeling feeling like a really rotten person probably for life I don't think you ever you know my my kids are adults now and both doing very well and everything else married settled you know so forth but I don't think you fully get over the guilt even then you know you think oh they probably did that for themselves I probably still wasn't good enough about this and I you know for chances are you didn't make any more mistakes than the average parent but there's something about that condemnation of a single parent and it was a long time ago as we were saying and so it wasn't very common certainly in the countryside it wasn't very common in those days and again with the same teacher of my son when he was young you know I remember being called in and she was saying she was upset about this or worried cross about that and you know what was my background and I said I was a single parent and she looked at me and she said I don't think we've had one of those before what oh my goodness (laughs) Wow. What did you say to and that? Then, oh, I mean, I'm, I went, sorry. And, you know, she repeated it. And then she told me afterwards that she'd had a word with all the parents in my year and told them they ought to make allowances. And that was worse, actually. I really wanted to hit her. You know, I thought, how dare you? I, it doesn't mean, you know, either myself or worse, my son is an any lesser person, you know. Oh, my goodness. Dreadful. Yeah, I am so sorry that you experienced that. And I mean, my mom was a single mom. My parents got divorced when I was in elementary school. Mm. So my mom was a single mom growing up and just talking to you now, it almost makes me, I'm, I'm married to my husband right now. We have one child, but it makes me view everything that she did from a different lens, just talking to somebody else about this and just seeing kind of getting an inside view of what was going on in her mind as she was doing this for us. So it's kind of a different perspective because I had the kids view of it, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now it would have been very tough for her, I'm sure. Oh yeah. I mean, it definitely was. There was, there was a lot of issues with (laughs) my parents' relationship. So it's better, honestly, that they did get divorced, but I mean, from a child's perspective, it's also difficult too. So there's just so many different things to navigate just with divorce in general. But um, I want to hear a little bit more about this business. So you were hitting the phones, mama bear kind of took over and you were just doing whatever you possibly could to be successful. So what happened after that? It's a really good description, actually. It felt exactly like mama bear. You know, I was going to lash out at anybody inside who stopped me. Um, but yeah, it took a, it took a while because you know that juggle of childcare and small business. You know, I couldn't 
do very much with it. And in honesty, I didn't know bar, bar selling, which I sort of got hang of and, and actually improved no end through necessity. Um, you know, I was a fairly quick learner about it, what worked and what didn't. <clears throat> there wasn't a huge amount I could do with the business <clears throat> while they were so young, you know, without... Um, I don't, I don't think it honestly crossed my mind, you know, when it slowly began to evolve, you know, and there became a couple of people who worked for me, they still, you know, we were all very chummy and it was still very relaxed and we juggled the hours and worked when we ne needed to and covered each other and, you know, they'd do the old school run if I had a terribly important client and, you know, it, it was that sort of setup. Uh, so... You know, that was probably easier. It wasn't financially very great, but, you know, it, it was OK. It was OK. It was good on quality of life. And I was there that, that probably lasted about six years. So, you know, it took, it took the kids which was into the teens, which was really important, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so it's a very, it was, it was a small business doing OK-ish you know, but very much a micro business. And by chance, my main supplier decided overnight to retire um, and came to me and said, terribly sorry, you know, you're out of luck next week. And I went, oh, you know, I mean, to me, after sort of six or seven years and the children are still the same situation. I mean, that was just total panic. So I thought, you actually, before, can be before we keep going, sorry, can you just explain a little bit about what you were doing in this business? Sure, I'm so sorry. I should have done that. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I mean, I was like I said, I was buying stuff in, and by that time, it had evolved more exactly into buying in furniture and a few other bits and pieces for interior designers. So this was a, a small artisan furniture, furniture um, company. Okay, so now I can see why it would be so debilitating when that yeah, main supplier. Absolutely said that stuck. Yeah. I mean, in come out the window. And so unprepared in every single way, I agreed with him. So he just wanted, you know, he'd reached that point, which I get actually, and I get even more since business owners can just hit a brick wall and think, I cannot get up in the morning, you know, if 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 you go on too long or you hit the wrong place or whatever that's another topic of conversation but yeah, we could talk about that for a his... long time <laughs> but I'm we sure, won't dive into I'm that sure. <laughs> he had definitely hit his brick wall brick wall and um, you know so it, he wasn't going to be talked out of it he wasn't going to be reasoned you know uh my children you know can we go keep going a little bit longer while i set something else up or anything else and so the long and the short of it was i we reached a deal whereby I took over his tiny staff and kept the thing going and, and paid him when I could. Um, and so it's sort of my tiny business and his tiny business were all of a sudden both being run by me. And that was just impractical, you know, and I had the bright idea, still not knowing remotely what I was doing, but wouldn't it be more sensible to put it all in one building? And so we did, and that was a factory, and that involved a lot of expense I didn't expect. And so I had to grow it and hit those phones, <laughs> you know, and the thing took off and until eventually, I mean, all sales driven, until eventually I had two factories and 40 odd stuff. And wow. There we are, you know. Yeah, from cold calling to a staff of 40. Yeah. Plus yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's an incredible story and just a testament to, Again, that mama bear instinct that kicked in and that Absolutely. Just really committing yourself to doing all of this work. Now, I have a question for you, and I don't know if you'll be able to pick one thing, but I would love to know over all of the years that you were running this business, is there one thing that you can pinpoint of doing wrong or something that you wish you wouldn't have done? And I'm sure there's a lot. About five million. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think. Um... Yeah, it is. It is difficult to narrow the field. <laughs> you can share a couple then. You can share a couple. That's fine. I think because I was very ignorant and, you know, I, I was always going at it um, 
without a very clear vision of where I was going. I vaguely assumed that children might like to work there as well. And it was only as they got older, I realized that was actually the wrong thing for them. Um, you know, that they needed to make their own lives. But that made me see that I now had a, what in essence had become a family business. But it wasn't a family business because there was no family going to be involved, which, you know, means you lose your way badly. You know, so I think it's really important to have your clear vision. And I'm not just talking vision statement and impact and all of that. I'm talking a vision of what you want to get out of it, where you want to go. And a B plan of what you're going to do if life doesn't turn out like that. Because life often doesn't turn out like that. You know, that's how you end up a single mom in the first place. So, you know, I really ought to have known better that life doesn't always turn out like that. Well, that's the fun of it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's exciting. Usually. <laughs> that's the positive spin that we'll take yeah. on that. So are you still working in that business now? No, what not, happened to it? I got to really a similar sort of um, brick wall. I, I had several offers to sell. And I kept on thinking, and this is probably another tip that I wish I'd known. Um, and that I know a lot more sense about. I think, again, because we don't imagine where we're going to part with our businesses. Um, you know, because they're going to have to drag me out of here screaming. We, you know, I love this business. And, you know, it's, it's a small business assumption. We never look, or, or, or rarely, the, the intelligent people do, but the, we rarely look at making it into a sellable commodity and, or, and or learn how to sell a business if we wanted to. And so when I started to look at selling, I realized that I was up against very sharp people, some, some essentially good sharp, some not so good sharp. And I felt so scared by it all. And, and as it turned out, I right, said so there was one deal that would have bankrupted me. But anyway, in the small print and complications, which I hadn't spotted, but luckily I just didn't like the feel of it. But, um, you know, I kept on pulling out deals to sell. And eventually I just got to the point of, of no return. And, and I thought, I don't, I can't get, go through one more day. You know, I don't care actually about money anymore. And I knew one of our competitors wanted to buy the brand to, to you know, sort of settle that. And I'd been playing a few tricks on a long way to try and acquire it. Um, and so I thought, you know, if that's the answer, it means he'll take a few of the people and to be by the brand and I will just walk away, you know, shut down the manufacturing side and not care anymore because there is more to life than this. When it gets to the point, to that brick wall point that you can't actually, having loved it for 20 years or, or certainly 15 out of the 20, and all of a sudden you'd rather shoot yourself in the foot, if not the head, than go to work. That's the moment you've gone several days too far. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And that's why when I work with my clients now, I'm all about creating lives around our businesses, not yeah. businesses around our lives. And it's, I mean, it's so much easier now given the online world than it was sure. or is in a brick and mortar or manufacturing or something like that. I assume I've never. I think it. it's, I think actually it is different with manufacturing because you don't have the online option. You have a lot of people, you have uh, sort of lots of responsibilities of health and safety and all sorts of things. And, you know, I think it's different. Yeah. For that sort of business, I don't think you can, um, you know, build your life around it in the same sort of way. I think, you know, that's, you have to want to do it in a different way. And I did yeah. for a long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious though. This just sparked a thought in my mind. Did you have it set up where you had like a management team overseeing the majority of the day to day, so you weren't it, as involved? It was one of the constant battles, and it's it's a, an, another good question. I did have a management team from start, and because um, the the skill set I took over, you see, I, I inherited the making side through this deal, well, not inherited, but took on the making side from this deal. 
And as usual, he was me, very ignorant, knew nothing about making stuff. And so I was very heavily reliant on the people I took over through that. And they were great craftsmen. Um, and it was obvious to me to put them in charge. And it's a real lesson that, of course, often the people who have the best skill set are not the best managers. Um, yes. You know, yes. so you we can never quite... We talked about that on another episode, yeah, too. I'm sure, I'm sure it's yeah. something you say. Um, yeah. You know, and that's a perfect example of it. But it's very difficult, I think. Business owners tend to feel disloyal if they've had people who've been with them for 10 years and, you know, for, for people have grown. And, of course, those people can probably cope with, a, you know, a team of three or four. Um, but, you know, all of a sudden, when faced with more than that, considerably more than that, they're completely out of their depths. And more to the point, they don't necessarily want to do it. But, you know, they sort of want the money. Well, no, they definitely want the money. And they definitely sort of want the prestige and the recognition that they are the people who are most knowledgeable. So it's, it's a really difficult challenge, that. Um, you know, and I, I tried it all sorts of ways and brought in outside management and the old brigade, you know, would have none of them because they didn't know as much. Um, you know, so, so you lost that way, but, you know, then you swung back and I never really, I mean, I did regularly have management teams, but I never had one that was quite right. Got near it, but never a good enough one. And I think had I had a, good, a strong enough management team, it would have been an entirely different matter. Mm -hmm. but, but that's that's key. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Having those other people that you can lean on so you don't have to be the one doing the majority of the work. That too. And you, you actually need to get, I mean, if you, by the time you get to running a business of that side, you, you actually need to come out of it and stop rescuing people and stop doing their work for them. Oh, yes. And work yes, on yes, the yes, business yes. development and where it's going and all those things, which there was never the time to do. You know, I was always working from sort of four in the morning until midnight uh, uh, without any sort of respite in it or, or idea or time to, to actually look at the future, you know, mm -hmm. it's all got to type up this list or, you know, crazy stuff. Shouldn't have right. And that's, well, I mean, in hindsight now, I'm sure you're realizing that that's so key to sitting in that CEO role is really focusing on the visionary. Oh, absolutely. Aspect. I mean, I knew it then. I just couldn't, you know, I've bashed my head against this, finding the right management. Because, of course, actually, the, the trade I was in was very skill short. You know, it's not like tech skills or something else. The furniture making craft in the UK, I don't know what it's like in the States, but it has really very nearly died out. And to complicate matters further, you know, um, we developed a, a fairly individual way of making which a lot of people from the outside couldn't handle when they came in they were used to making it one way um so there was this tremendous skills problem about bringing people in from the outside too yeah you that's know, so it, interesting i've never thought about really it that hard. but that makes sense i know i know because of course like you know the, the furniture market over here certainly changed from you know with ikea particularly um, you know, and high fashion furniture all of a sudden lots of, you know, you went from, you know, inheriting grandma's table to, you know, buying something down at Ikea then high lacquer almost overnight and, and the old skills just died out. And so you got people in their, you know, sort of late working years who, who chose to take early retirement as, as firms folded. And, you know, the younger people simply retrained and went on to something else and why not? Mm -hmm. so, so that was a real issue as well. Yeah, no, that I've never thought about that. But yeah, that makes complete sense. Absolutely. So now where are, where are things now? So what have you been doing since you sold that? Well, I'm, I've been indulging myself really um, in that, you know, towards the end of those years, I'd become obsessed with finding out, you know, what I could have done better, you know, had I had more knowledge. And so I, I went on a lot of interesting courses and talked to a lot of interesting people. And 
then I also started writing for a business magazine. And so when I, I finally got free and my own time back, I decided to have a go at doing what I wanted to do, which is, is what I'd always wanted to do, which is write books and articles, um, which I do about business or entrepreneurship in particular. That's amazing. I love that you were finally able to shift into what you're passionate about. And yeah, it's lovely because, of course, you know, I mean, I was never passionate. I mean, I, you know, I came to love my company and be very passionate about it. But I can't say I ever dreamed of running a manufacturing company. Yeah. I don't know too many people who do have that dream. No, no <laughs> it's probably not high on people's list. <laughs> right. Well, I would love to know if you could give feedback or guidance to other single moms who are in your position, who maybe they're like we were talking about, maybe they're in a nine to five job and they want to leave or they're thinking about starting a business or they are running a business right now. Do you have any feedback or tips or advice that you could share with them? I think, I mean, the first important thing is you will be just as good a mother. You will learn to juggle. You will learn to trade off. And the kids are far more adaptable than you are, actually. I think they come to accept that this is mum's working time. And, you know, unless there's a crisis, you leave her alone and then she's going to take you to a park afterwards or whatever. Far quicker than you think they will. And, and actually, they, I tend to think in some ways they benefit from it. You know, I noticed that when I interview entrepreneurs, which I do a lot, you know, very successful ones, you know, a lot of them come from divorced families or single parents or whatever, because, you know, or, or parents with businesses, because they learn to absorb that, you know, talks all about business sitting around the kitchen table from a very young age. And so, you know, they become very good entrepreneurs as a process. So, yeah. so it's not all bad. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed that in myself, I've become, I mean, I don't know if this stemmed from my parents' divorce or not, but I'm very resilient in that way. Like I can, I can quickly bounce back. So maybe it stemmed from that. I, I'm not Absolutely. sure. I, I think that's very true, Steph. Yeah. You know, um, there's somebody I know who's got, who, who studies entrepreneurs in that way. And the, the instance of something having happened in an entrepreneur's childhood is incredibly high. I mean, I think it's sort of 77% of entrepreneurs have had some sort of upheaval in their childhood. Yeah. It's really interesting. That's very interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, it makes sense though, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, this has been such a good conversation. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your story. This is going to be so helpful for not only single moms, but I think moms in general, because I got a lot out of it too. So where is the best place for everybody to connect with you if they want to come say hi? Absolutely. I would love to hear from any of your listeners, Steph. And um, please come over to my website, which is jamcavell.co.uk. You'll find me on most of the social media channels, but I'm very vocal on Twitter and post fairly regularly on LinkedIn and on both. You'll only get one Jan Cavell, so I'm easy to find. Perfect. We will also link to those in the show notes just in case you have any issues, but it'll be there for easy access. So easy access. So thank you again for being here, Jan. This was, this was such a good conversation. I enjoy, Steph. It's lovely to see you. <laughs>